Hello everyone. Welcome to the groundwater hydrology and management course on NPTEL. This is week two, lecture one. In the first week of groundwater hydrology and management course, we looked at the course content, the weekly breakup of the classes, and also a small introduction to groundwater. In today's lecture or throughout this week, we will look at the importance of groundwater. So someone might ask us, why are you looking at groundwater? Why do you want to study groundwater? So for that aspect, it is important to understand the relevance of groundwater in hydrology, both internationally and globally, also with the Indian market. Why? Because as I mentioned in my earlier slides, India is the maximum or the most extractor of groundwater in rank number one, followed by US and China. India consumes more groundwater than US and China put together. So before we get into the statistics of that, let's understand the water balance. Of the water which is available, 100% of the water, 97% is locked in oceans and seas. So you see vast amount of water which is locked in oceans and seas. And you all know that it is not readily used for human consumption, domestic use, industrial use, and agricultural use. So domestic, when I mean domestic, it is for drinking and also washing, cleaning, bathing, etc. So the available water is very less, approximately 3%. And of the 3%, the freshly available water only 2% is locked in ice caps and glaciers. So most of the fresh water available, which is 3% of the entire water balance, is already locked in your glaciers and ice caps. It is not readily usable or readily available. What do I mean when I say readily usable? It's in an ice format. So you cannot bring ice to your table and then melt it and use it for drinking. Some countries where they have it very nearby, they may use it. But think about using Himalaya ice water for uh, somewhere in the north uh, or northeast. It's not possible. So what is the next part of the fresh water? Only 1% of the total available, right? So of this 1%, most of the water is groundwater, which is 0.9%, whereas the remaining are in lakes, swamps, and rivers, and other resources. The other resources include biological water stored, water stored in, in crops, plants, fruits, etc. So all the big, big lakes and rivers that you see in the world can only hold a very, very small percent of fresh water, which is 0.009% approximately. Whereas your groundwater can hold most of it, right? So that is where, when you talk about fresh water, groundwater plays very, very key uh, ranking or key importance, both internationally and in India because this is the water that can be tapped for domestic use, agricultural use, and industrial use. So in this week, what we're going to look at is why and how limited groundwater resources are, the reality of groundwater resources globally. It's not an endless supply of water. It's not as big as the oceans uh, and uh, seas, which is very, very small when you compare to the net available water on the planet. However, when you talk about fresh water, it is the biggest component. So it is very important to understand the global importance of groundwater resources. Looking at in this week's lecture, I also encourage students to look into the news articles and also update yourself regularly 
on the groundwater importance. Issues and concerns will also be discussed in this week, groundwater resources, where it's highly used, why it's highly used, those kind of issues. And concerns because of uh, unsustainable groundwater use, what are the concerns? How much water do we have for the future generation and, and children? So all these issues and concerns would be uh, discussed uh, in this week. And we'll also look into groundwater footprints. So similar to carbon footprints, similar to water footprints or virtual water, we also have groundwater footprint to understand where or how the water that is taken from one location travels across for as a product or as an economic viability of drinking water or any other use. So basically, how do you take one water and then uh, export it to another region? And also understand how much area contributes groundwater. So let's look at groundwater resources in the world. So that will be our quick introduction. So what you see here is a, a big map made by all the major international players who actively work on uh, groundwater protection, conservation. Uh, for example, UNESCO and IOH, International Association of Hydrologists. What you see is the world can be mapped predominantly into three categories for groundwater resources. One is the major groundwater basins, which is in blue color. And within the blue color, there are variability in groundwater recharge. So how much water can get into the system is kind of an, uh, a proxy for how much water you can take out. Okay, so that is given as your blue color. And within the blue color, you have different shades of very high groundwater recharge to very low groundwater recharge. So uh, visualize your groundwater storage uh, or groundwater unit as a bank account. That's a simple analogy we can make. So you have a bank account and it is not an unlimited supply. No one's going to be putting uh, money uh, every time without your knowledge. Okay? And it's not unlimited. So it is a it is a constructed limited resource that is your groundwater and in that monthly you're putting your salary and then you're taking expenses out uh, now and then using credit card debit card atm whatever it is so similarly you have a groundwater unit and inside comes your recharge and discharge can happen multiple ways your recharge can also be in multiple terms if you have your bank account, you can get your salary, you can get your interest from your account, you can get your uh, rental that can come into your account. So similarly, visualize a groundwater unit, groundwater storage unit, and inside that there are multiple water that can come in. And same way, discharge can happen multiple uh, locations and uh, different rates. So you do have a very high groundwater recharge aquifer or a unit, for now let's keep it as a groundwater unit. And most of India in the northern part is in the blue color. So let's look at first India and then globally. Uh, the uh, Indo-Gangetic Plain and the Brahmaputra uh, Plains have very fertile resources for groundwater. So you can see the recharge is very high and uh, the land and environment and hydroclimate is very conducive for water to recharge rapidly. You also get a good rainfall. So that helps in recharging actively the aquifers. So aquifer is the unit for groundwater storage. So similarly in watersheds and hydrology, we saw that uh, you needed a watershed boundary. Here we call it aquifer. So an aquifer is the storage unit for groundwater. So the Indo-Gangetic Brahmaputra aquifers are very, very highly yielding and very high recharge rates. Whereas most of the other parts of India come under the areas with complex hydrogeological structure. Complex means it has different geological setting. Rocks are different uh, and the storage within the rock is very different. So we will look at it uh, in detail in the coming class when we talk about physical groundwater hydrology. What constitutes hydrology, we will discuss. 
and also we will look into the different aspects of groundwater recharge. Okay. So you see most of India has a very uh, uh, complex structure, especially in the middle, central and uh, eastern regions. And when you come to southern regions, the uh, complexity is available. Also, the groundwater recharge is very low. And that is where you see a lot of people uh, putting in bore wells, digging new wells, but getting into loss. So this is the scenario of India. We have both the high yielding aquifers or high recharge aquifers, groundwater uh, resources. Also, we have complex groundwater resources where water availability is very low. Then we have some areas with local and shallow aquifers, which is very small uh, aquifers, very localized. Uh, it doesn't yield that much uh, recharge uh, and groundwater is a concern. Okay, So that part you can see here in Gujarat region. Moving across the world, uh, the blue areas, most of European uh, regions, Australia, part of Australia, uh, Africa, the central regions of Africa, uh, South America and North America have good yielding aquifers, good yielding groundwater resources. The recharge rate is pretty high and this area with all the big, big rivers and forested ecosystem has a very conducive uh, environment for groundwater resources. In the remaining regions, the area is very, very uh, localized and shallow. If you look at uh, Canada and uh, Russia, where the uh, groundwater recharge is very low and also very localized because of the geological setting. Most of those areas are frozen, not much agriculture happens, so not much extraction happens, and so the recharge is also very slow. Some central parts of Australia uh, and Africa also come under the picture. Then you have the green uh, areas with a high complex structure, and you could see that most of India comes under it, and similarly Canada, wherever you see uh, uh, a very uh, high complexity, the groundwater recharge is very low comparatively, uh, and storage is very uh, low. So if you look at the Middle Eastern countries, the Arab countries, they also have such aquifers along with Australia. Someone might ask, so uh, groundwater uh, in Africa is very blue in this in this picture, but still, if you look at images from Africa, they don't have enough agriculture, they don't have enough water, they're struggling for water, what is the reason? The reason is the aquifer is present, groundwater is present at high, high volumes. However, the way to access it is very expensive. In India, it's very shallow. And so you can put a pump and take it out. Energy is available. You have hydropower, you have solar power for groundwater extraction, diesel power, fossil uh, fuel powered uh, engines, pumps. But in Africa, they cannot afford it. And because they could not afford it, the groundwater resources have not been tapped. So this is the understanding why some regions are still blue and still uh, under the water starvation countries. If you look at European countries, they have very good aquifers or good groundwater recharge, uh, but they also use very less because they don't do much agriculture. Most of the agricultural products are imported, like India supplies, Pakistan, and, um, Vietnam, China, uh, Malaysia, they supply food uh, to these countries. And so they don't uh, grow much agriculture. They don't need that much hot water. So India is pumping a lot producing these agricultural outputs and also exporting them. So we'll discuss this uh, in the ground. Continuing to with major global groundwater resources, um, uh, there are multiple studies. Uh, you looked at the previous slide, uh, we saw many, many universities, uh, UNESCO, IH coming together, and IAEA, all these big international agencies coming together to map the groundwater resources. However, there are other agencies and studies like Taylor et al. 2013, they have made also similar maps using different methods. So the methods may not be the same. Uh, however, the uh, overall groundwater mapping is similar. You look at uh, their study, the major regional aquifers or major groundwater systems are in dark blue. Uh, and they are in India, it is the Indo-Gangetic plain, some parts of Brahmaputra. In uh, Australia, it is a great Artesian basin. 
along the uh, African regions, it's the Nubian sandstone aquifer system, Northwest Sahara aquifer system. And in the US, it is the high uh, plains aquifer in California Central Valley. These are very high yielding aquifers. And if you look at these regions, that is where a lot of agriculture also happens. Uh, if you come to uh, the uh, South American countries, we have the Guarani aquifer. And uh, in China, it is the North China Plains aquifer. These are the high yielding major regional aquifers. They uh, have a high yield and high recharge. And so they support a lot of populations. If you look at the uh, groundwater uh, use in the Ganges Basin, it almost uh, caters to uh, a big population that surrounds the Ganges Plain. Okay? Uh, it's very hard to put a number, but uh, indirectly the Ganges Basin supports 1 billion population. Okay, and that is with surface water and groundwater resources. Let's move on. The areas with some important but complex aquifers are in the green, um, as similar to the previous study, and that uh, encompasses most of India uh, and some parts of your European uh, nations, uh, North and South America. Um, Australia, these regions. So they are very complex, and the complexity comes because of the geology, the ground, under the ground, what is available, the rock, the sediments, that determines the complexity. We will get into that uh, when we discuss uh, the groundwater uh, hydrology and physical uh, parameters. But for now, it is better to understand where are the major systems and why are they major, etc. So major also reflects a good, healthy groundwater status. So if you look at most of India, it is under the complex, but the Indo-Gangetic plain still has a lot of water. Similarly, if you look at the uh, European regions, there's a lot of groundwater. And as I said earlier, um, there is a lot of groundwater in some regions because they don't use it much. If you come to South America, there's a lot of forest. And, and healthy big rivers that flow like Nile. Uh, so what they do is they have a lot of water resources that recharge the groundwater and also a healthy forest system that supports healthy groundwater. Okay, so there's always a link uh, with the uh, environment and the geology on assessing the groundwater status. Areas of generally low permeability and local aquifers. So local minor, very small, small aquifers are present in the rest of the world. Iceland, there's no need for looking at it, but uh, and Greenland. But uh, if you look at other regions, there are fairly a lot of complex uh, aquifers, uh, groundwater systems, uh, and mostly localized groundwater systems are present. So what happens with the local is there's a lot of complexity. So uh, a groundwater status, how much water you can extract might differ from one location to the other location because it is very local and the properties change. So that is what Taylor et al. shows here in China um, and most parts of the Americas. You see that it is uh, a very locally uh, aquifer system, uh, locally uh, in terms of very localized in small, small pockets. Uh, and the properties change. So you cannot apply one recharge rate or one yield rate for it. On this note, it is very important to understand the groundwater footprint because as I said earlier, it is uh, these aquifers are present, uh, but it is also present because they may not be using the water much. So uh, we need to tap on how much water is actually used and what is the footprint. Let's define groundwater footprint as per Gleason et al. 2012. This paper argues that um, groundwater footprint can be coined or determined as the area required to sustain groundwater use and groundwater dependent ecosystem. So ecosystem services is all the uh, biotic and abiotic services or living organisms that need water and contribute to the environment, like worms, trees, etc. So how much water they need, etc., is, is documented. So the groundwater footprint could be the area uh, that the groundwater aquifer or the groundwater system needs uh, so that it can satisfy all these uh, groundwater system dependent ecosystems. 
Okay, so it is the area need to sustain the groundwater use. It shows that this study shows that uh, 3.5 times higher than the aquifer and it supports up to 1.7 billion people. So all the major aquifers they mapped uh, and they looked at how much area is needed to activity, the current activity uh, in the aquifers. For example, uh, groundwater aquifer or a storage can be used for agriculture, domestic, industrial. So they took uh, account of all this uh, water that is needed, budgeted all the water, and then looked at the area that the groundwater aquifer needs to sustain such use. And what the study found was very um, concerning because of the groundwater demand uh, almost 3.5 times uh, higher is the area that needs to uh, sustain the groundwater use. So to visually put it, look at uh, the Ganges uh, Basin or Upper Ganges Basin, um, the area is four times, up to four times bigger than your actual groundwater. So to get water into your groundwater aquifer or unit, you need to conserve an area which is almost four times uh, and uh, um, that is the area that is required. So water should be caught, water should be pushed into your aquifer system uh, or infiltrated, recharged, uh, and then the groundwater use. So it's up to 3.5 times. And more importantly, they documented who's using it and what is the population that is directly linked to these aquifers. So the main aquifers are the Western Mexico aquifer, the High Plains aquifer in the United States, uh, the North Arabian uh, plains uh, in the uh, Middle East and the Persian along with the Persian aquifers, uh, along with that the upper Ganges basin and the North China plains. All the others are aquifers but and groundwater systems, but they are not as uh, important or as uh, um, predominant as these aquifers discussed in this paper. So what these major aquifers are doing, uh, are catering to a big population according to 1.7 billion in 2012. Uh, that is almost by saying uh, every two people out of seven uh, are using the groundwater from this region. So at that time, uh, let's approximate the population to be 7 billion. So out of 7 billion, approximately 2 billion people are using water from these aquifer systems or are dependent on these aquifer systems. So it supports these people, both for food, for domestic, industrial, et cetera. Um, and that's where the dependence, actually the dependence causes more importance to the aquifers and more land needs to be preserved. So uh, when we have these aquifers in picture, please understand that there are a lot of transboundary aquifers, which means Ganges water can be used uh, by our neighboring countries also. So it is important to understand how much volume does everyone use. So we looked at the uh, different groundwater aquifers in, in the world. We looked at uh, the groundwater footprint or how much water is being extracted versus the area that needs to be conserved. Uh, let's now look at the actual volumes. Let's put numbers here. And this study by Shah uh, in 2014 uh, Professor Shah collected these values and plotted it uh, very uh, beautifully to show that the volume of water extracted in the ground by groundwater pumps and other resources uh, is approximately 260 to 255 kilometer cube per year for India. Whereas it is much uh, lesser for other countries, even though it is high. So India is ranked number one uh, and the rate is around 260 to 55 kilometer cube per year, whereas the next country, uh, which is ranked two is uh, Americas or United States with uh, around uh, 100 or 110 uh, cubic meter per year, uh, followed by China uh, with around uh, 80 to uh, 90 uh, kilometer cube per year. So if you add all this, uh, you see that the total is still uh, much lesser than the amount water India uses, groundwater. In other words, the groundwater used by India is more than the next two countries combined, which is US and China. But that's not it. Look at the size of the countries. US and India are, are comparably uh, very, very different in uh, land size. India is much smaller compared to US and China. 
However, our groundwater use is much, much higher. So this is a concern, okay? So that's one concern you see from this graph. The other concern you see is most of the Asian countries uh, are still increasing. If you look at India, uh, it's slowly started in the industrial revolution area, and then in the green revolution time, it just picked up and it's still going on. There's no sign of it slowing down, the groundwater volume. Every uh, 10 years, it seems to increase. Whereas uh, the other countries like Western and European countries have almost tapered off. Tapered means it almost stabilizes. Okay, it has hit the peak and it is stabilizing. It doesn't go above a particular level or it doesn't keep increasing. It is not uh, as uh, increasing like here we see an exponential uh, increase, uh, whereas uh, this increase is almost stabilized. Same with China, it is increasing, but not as rigorous as India uh, and other countries like Western Europe is almost coming down um, in groundwater use, uh, whereas the Asian countries are slowly pulling up. Ghana is coming up, Spain, uh, but most importantly, Pakistan, Sri Lanka are all slowly coming up and they started to move upwards after 1980s, whereas uh, India started 1960s, 1950s and it didn't even slow down. So this is how countries compare. Uh, and as I said, some countries have already stabilized uh, while Asian countries uh, are still continuing water extraction, which means it's going up. So what does it show to you in a different connotation is that the Western countries are shifting the focus of water, where to use, how to use water. Whereas the Asian countries are still using water for agriculture very, very uh, less efficiently. Uh, and groundwater is tapped readily without understanding the consequences. So that is a concern and everyone has to uh, look at it. So as I said, why, why these countries are using so much groundwater is a concern. And for that, it is very important to look at what are the key users for these um, groundwater resources. Just looking at these nations like India, uh, China, and uh, which other countries you have uh, Bangladesh, you can clearly understand that there is some trend why these countries use so much groundwater. You should first look at the groundwater uh, use uh, volume. So here we look at it 260 to 55 kilometer cube in India. And then we should look at what are the key resources uh, that are being used for groundwater or which are the key um, users uh, for this groundwater, let's say agriculture, industry, uh, domestic, etc. So if you divide all this, we can clearly understand for each country, what is the major use for groundwater? And that we will look uh, in detail in the upcoming lecture, in lecture two. For now, uh, let's stop on understanding where our major user is, which are the key countries that are using this groundwater. Uh, and also uh, understand that most countries are in the Western part are slowing down in groundwater use or, or are stabilizing, uh, whereas uh, the Asian countries are still on the up. Is this sustainable is the question that should come up. Is this good uh, or is this bad? So bad as in the sense, can we continue such a behavior of using groundwater uh, uh, without uh, stopping? Uh, or can we or should we stop? So all this we will look into in detail this week. Uh, let's start with the major user for groundwater in the upcoming lecture. With this, uh, I'd like to stop uh, the uh, week two, lecture one. <laughs>